Telencephalon, yes? Telencephalon. So this is telencephalon. At the stage of three brain vesicles, it is developed from prosencephalon. And at the stage of five brain vesicles, it is telencephalon. And so we said that into the telencephalon, cerebral hemispheres are included, as well as some structures of white matter, which uh, connect two cerebral hemispheres with each other. For example, corpus callosum, here we will see, fornix, that is not present here. So these structures. Uh, topography of telencephalon, it occupies... Uh, completely anterior cranial fossa, yes, uh, in the anterior cranial fossa, frontal lobes are located, then middle cranial fossa for temporal lobes, and occipital lobes, they are located in cranial wall, not in the cranial fossa, because it is located above the groove for transverse sinus, so in two superior fovea. You have to be able to, dis ah, syncope is clear, yes, like it surrounds all the other structures of the brain, like around uh, diencephalon and below occipital lobes of cerebral hemispheres uh, there are cerebellar hemispheres so that is a syntopy you have to be able to distinguish right and left cerebral hemisphere so this one is right why because each hemisphere has three surfaces there is superlateral surface that is convex medial surface that is flattened and in medial surface we can see corpus callosum an inferior surface, it has irregular shape, anterior part is flattened, and posterior part is a concave because here there are cerebral, uh, cerebellar sorry, hemispheres. So this one is right. We also can see that surface of cerebral hemispheres is not smooth, so it contains uh, depressed areas which are sulci and elevated areas which are gyri. And uh, using some the most important sulci, we can also identify whether it is right or left. For example, here on superlateral surface, we can see lateral sulcus, or sylvian sulcus it is named. It is directed anteroinferiorly, and it separates frontal and parietal lobes above from temporal lobe below. So this, like this, we also can see that this is right hemisphere. So when we look at the whole brain, uh, first of all, we can see that uh, there are some sulci which are deeper than the others. And they are named fissures. So for uh, the most um, significant, here there is longitudinal fissure of the brain, fissura longitudinalis, that separates two cerebral hemispheres from each other. And here behind we can see transverse fissure of the brain, fissura transversa, that separates occipital lobes of cerebral hemispheres from cerebellar hemispheres. This is transverse fissure of the brain. So in each cerebral hemisphere, there are five lobes. Though in some books it's written that they are four. You should check what is written in BDC. So uh, traditionally, yes, four lobes. It is frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and occipital lobe. But in Russian textbooks, it's uh, in some of them, it's written that there is additional fifth lobe that can be visible when we separate from each other margins which form lateral sulcus and look inside, we will see the fifth lobe that is named insula. <clears throat> what this is insula here we can see like this is lateral sulcus here we can see insula uh, you have to know uh, this pattern of uh, cerebral hemispheres so there are constant sulci and gyri some of them are inconstant we have to know about constant so frontal lobe <clears throat> this one uh, we said that lateral sulcus separates frontal lobe from temporal lobe inferiorly and here behind there is central sulcus sulcus centralis that separates frontal lobe from parietal lobe posteriorly. This is sulcus centralis. Uh, so that is it. Frontal lobe. Here in the frontal lobe, in front of central sulcus, there is precentral gyrus, gyrus precentralis. And in front of precentral gyrus, there is precentral sulcus, sulcus precentralis. Anteriorly from precentral sulcus, two more sulci pass. It is superior frontal sulcus, uh, sulcus uh, frontalis superior, and inferior frontal sulcus, sulcus frontalis inferior. And these two sulci, they separate this substance, part of um, frontal lobe, in superlateral surface, into three more gyri, superior frontal gyrus, middle frontal gyrus, and inferior frontal gyrus. That's it. It's what we can see on medial, uh, on superlateral surface. On medial surface of 
frontal lobe, we can see that right above corpus callosum, there is groove of corpus callosum and it continues from frontal lobe to parietal and even to the occipital, yes, the sulcus corporis callosi, above it there is cingulate gyrus, uh, gyrus cinguli, above there is cingulate sulcus, which continues to marginal part, pars marginalis, this one. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, this is what we can see. Ah, and below, above it, we can see upper medial surface of superior frontal gyrus. Then if we look at the inferior surface of frontal lobe, we can see that in the most medially uh, there is straight gy gyrus, gyrus rectus. Medially, there is gyrus rectus. Then, laterally, this gyrus rectus is bounded by olfactory sulcus or renal sulcus, where olfactory tract passes. Uh, then, laterally from it, there are numerous uh, ophthalmic gyri or orbital, orbital gyri. They are irregular in shape, but here there are orbital gyri. Okay. Uh, then, parietal lobe. Parietal lobe is separated from frontal lobe by means of central sulcus. And from temporal lobe, it is separated by lateral sulcus. And from occipital lobe, uh, on the medial surface of cerebral hemispheres, here we can see parieta occipital sulcus, sulcus parieta occipitalis. Uh, it separates parietal lobe from occipital lobe. On the superlateral surface, we cannot see this parieta occipital sulcus, just imaginary continuation of it. So here... In the mm, later, superlateral surface of parietal lobe, behind the central sulcus, there is postcentral gyrus, gyrus postcentralis. Behind postcentral gyrus, there is postcentral sulcus, sulcus postcentralis. And from upper part of this postcentral sulcus, uh, in oblique direction, like posteriorly and downward, intraparietal sulcus pass, sulcus intraparietalis. And it separates substance of parietal lobe of super, um, superlateral surface into two lobules, superior parietal lobule and inferior parietal lobule. Here in inferior parietal lobule, uh, there are two, two gyri distinguished. There is marginal, supramarginal gyrus, gyrus supramarginalis, that surrounds posterior end of lateral sulcus and angular gyrus, gyrus angularis, that uh, surrounds posterior end of superior temporal sulcus. Superior temporal sulcus, it is already a part of temporal lobe. Okay, now on the medial surface, we what can see? Continuation of cingulate gyrus, it continues here to parahippocampal gyrus. Mm -hmm. You slept on Monday. Now it's here. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then this parahippocampal gyrus like curves from posterior side. And it ends with uncus. Mm -hmm. Uncus, yes. Mm -hmm. Where is it? Where is my... Um, here, due, because of the presence of structures of diencephalon, we cannot uh, see it clearly. But here I can show you that this cingulate gyrus continues to parahippocampal and it ends with uncus. So this part is named uncus. uncus. Yes. Uh, what else? So parietal lobe is not visible from inferior surface because from inferior it is covered by temporal lobe. Mm -hmm. So that is it. Uh, no, not, not the end. Also, yes, we said this uh, cingulate sulcus yes, ends with marginal part, pars marginalis, and here uh, between this marginal part of cingulate sulcus and parietal occipital sulcus, this part is named cuneus, cuneus, no, not cuneus, precuneus, I'm sorry, cuneus is here in the occipital lobe, yes. And this pars marginalis of cingulate uh, sulcus, it separates from each other upper part of post-central gyrus from upper part of pre-central gyrus. And they together here form um, paracentral lobule, lobulus paracentralis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then temporal lobe. Temporal lobe is separated from parietal and frontal by means of lateral sulcus. And between temporal and occipital lobes, there is no clear boundary. Many gyri of temporal lobe just continue into occipital lobe and vice versa. So here, 
on the superlateral surface, we can see two sulci, superior and inferior temporal sulci. They separate this substance into three gyri, superior temporal gyrus, middle temporal gyrus, and inferior temporal gyrus. Inferior temporal gyrus is visible from inferior surface also. Uh, medially from inferior temporal gyrus, there is uh, collateral sulcus, sulcus collateralis. Here, not, no, I think this is collateral sulcus, sulcus, this will, you will check. And here there are two more gyri, lateral occipital temporal gyrus and medial occipital temporal gyrus. Or maybe it is collateral. You will check. Yes. Okay. Uh, then in the occipital. In the occipital lobe, on superlateral surface, all the gyri, they are in constant. There are just numerous occipital gyri, so very um, different pattern in different people. And here in the medial surface, on the medial surface, we can see uh, par parietal occipital sulcus, and be this region below parietal occipital sulcus is known as cuneus, due to its cuneiform shape, yes? This is pre-cuneus, so in front of cuneus, and this is cuneus. And in the middle of cuneus, we can see calcarine sulcus, sulcus calcarinus. This is cortical, ah, this we will see later, yes, here there is cortical center of vision. And on the inferior surface, we can see continuations of lateral and medial occipital temporal gyri. So why do we need to know this in such a details? Because um, here, you know, uh, gray matter is presented by cortex and nuclei, yes? Cortex has more complicated structures than cortex of cerebellum. It has six layers. What are they? We discussed uh, at the lecture on Monday. Yes. Are you recording? Uh, so I have stopped there. During which you were sleeping. That's why you will read it at the, in the book yourself. And so each part of cortex is actually responsible for different functions. Yes, we discussed it also. Mm -hmm. Shaori as a lecture. Yes, Shaori will explain you this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. What you have learned in the last day? Uh, you were absent now at last, so you can't ask me. So, Explain me now. After the, the lesson, uh -huh. yeah, after the lesson, he will explain no, no. everything. Yes. Maybe if he didn't, he didn't know, can Akash explain? And because he didn't say. Akash cannot also explain because he skipped my lecture. Okay, if he skipped, then give him a talk. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> you do like that. <laughs> Uh, uh, lecture, lecture. But if yeah. you skip my lecture on Monday, yes, I will give you a trouble card. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Monday. On Monday, yes. Next Monday. Ma'am, yes, ma I can attend today, na? No? Uh, you have a, a class of uh, lecture with the doctor, uh, dentistry group? No, it will be next week. You can attend next Monday with them. But then is the time we'll give Dr. Irina, not you. No, it's me. <laughs> now it's me. I know. One lecture with Irina is today. One week here and uh, no. one week here. <laughs> You may come yes with dentistry or with uh, second part of uh, you general medicine. You teach them the talents of the yes. part. Okay. <laughs> okay. What did I say? That uh, different parts of cortex they are responsible for different functions, and such a distribution of functions uh, was uh, studied by uh, neuroanatomist uh, Broadman. Yes, and these areas are known as Broadman areas. Yes, and they are clearly uh, described in BDC, so in all these Indian textbooks, they are given in details. Actually, we are not interested in numbers, but you study it, will, you will need it uh, for FMG, for all of these exams, yes. We are interested in functions more. So, for example, uh, cortex of precentral gyrus, cortex of precentral gyrus, it is the main somatomotor area, or primary motor cortex. So, from here, all pyramidal tracts start from the fifth layer of cortex that is present, uh, presented by giant pyramid cells or pet cells, corticospinal, corticonuclear, corticopontine tracts, all of them start from here. And distribution of uh, cells from which fibers start uh, is known as motor homunculus here. Like this homunculus, this small human homunculus, yes, it uh, lies here upside down, this projection of uh, these areas. For example, fibers which move to head and neck, they uh, start from lower one side of this precentral gyrus. 
And fibers which move to upper limbs, they start from middle one third. And fibers which move to lower limbs, lower parts of the body, they start from upper one third. Uh, Postcentral gyros uh, is known as the main somatosensory area or primary sensory cortex. All ascending tracts, conscious, yes, spinothalamic, bulbothalamic, of general sensation, they end here on the fourth layer of uh, cerebral cortex. And the arrangement is the same. And at the lecture, we also discussed that uh, some regions of our body, they have larger representations than the other, because some regions, they are more sensitive. Some regions are better mobile than the others. For example, for the hand, there is a very big uh, area for representation. For the leg, it's not that much big, yes? So, and this distribution is known as sensory homunculus. <coughs> Actually, all the centers in the cortex are divided into two big groups, projectional and association. Projectional centers are those which exist in the cortex of a newborn. So from the very birth, even in the fetal period, they are formed, and by the moment of birth, they all are present. They are named projectional because they are directly connected with lower parts of brain by conducting tracts. So this primary motor cortex, primary sensory cortex, these are projectional centers. There is projectional center of hearing or primary auditory cortex. It is located here in superior temporal gyrus. There are hirsches, gyri, small, and this is primary auditory cortex. Primary visual cortex is located here in calcarine sulcus, yes, in the occipital lobe. Cortical center of olfaction, also primary, is located, or and taste uh, together, is located in uncus and in perihippocampal gyrus. Not in the frontal lobe? No, for olfaction over here it's in uncus. It was written like a you know, olfaction region will be present in the frontal lobe now? In frontal lobe I think there is secondary cortex. Oh, uh, I mean we are about the primary, primary cortex. Primary, now primary, yes. For the child one. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, I think primary. Mm -hmm. Okay, and association centers are those which are formed, uh, which are developed after human acquires any skill. So they do not exist from the, uh, from the birth, yes, they uh, form later. So if person learns to do something, this center is formed. If person uh, till the very end of his life, till his death, still cannot do it, then it's not formed. For example, uh, when child learns to speak, then here, in the posterior one third of inferior frontal gyrus, Broca's area is formed, or central of verbal speech. Why is it located here? Uh, association centers, they do not directly uh, connect with uh, lower parts of brain, but they are connected with corresponding projectional centers. So through corresponding projectional centers. When we speak, uh, muscles of our face, of our head work, yes? So projectional center for this is located in lower one third of precentral gyrus, yes? So due to anatomic proximity, this Broca's area is formed in posterior one third of uh, inferior frontal gyrus. When person learns to write, here in posterior one third of middle uh, frontal gyrus, center of written speech is formed. Uh, again, why here? Because fibers, motor fibers, which go to upper limbs, they start from middle one third of uh, precentral gyrus, yes? So very close to each other. Uh, here, in the posterior one third of superior temporal gyrus, uh, secondary auditory cortex is formed. It is Wernicke's area. When person learns to comprehend the speech, yes, Wernicke's area. Like, uh, usually child first learns to understand what, uh, as the other people say, yes, and then only to speak. And the more languages we know, the better this Wernicke's area is um, developed. Here, in parietal lobe, for example, uh, in superior parietal lobule, uh, center of stereognosia is formed. Yes, it's when we can easily recognize objects but without our vision. Why here? Because these centers of general sensation are located in post-central gyrus, yes? And so, again, very close to form stereognosia center. What's the connection between the general sensation and stereognosis? You, uh, re you recognize objects without vision by mm -hmm. using your general sensation only, touch, pressure, these things, okay. yes? So it's information about this spinal salamic tract and here in post-central gyrus, in primary sensory cortex. In inferior parietal lobule, praxia center is formed. Here, it is formed when we acquire any of these purposeful movements, purposeful skills, like when we learn to ride a bike, uh, learn what, to play piano, 
to print on the computer keyboard, yes? This is skill which after that we do automatically, yes? And so because of this praxia center here in inferior parietal lobule. What else? No, so there are many, or they are described in the book. You have to know all of them. Mm -hmm. There is special center to recognize faces. Now I don't remember where it is located. Like recently I also started to, to watch the movie. Uh, and when uh, this center is damaged, person uh, suffers from prosopognosia. Prosopo means face. Gnosia are uh, like negative prefix, gnosis, rec recognize, yes? So prosopognosia is a disease when person cannot recognize faces of even very familiar to him people. Mm -hmm. no, there is, no, you will find where it is located, now I don't remember. Okay, so we're in temporal lobe, I guess. Yes. Okay, so you have, when you describe, as the next lesson, when you describe each loop, yes, you have first tell boundaries, then you should tell about each of the gyri, gyros and sulcus, which is present here, and also localization of centers in cortex of this particular loop. You have to know. So this for the next lesson about this external structure. Mm -hmm. uh, what? Yes. Uh, like in matter. the layer? Uh -huh. In the fourth layer, fifth layer, we have to discuss. Of course. Okay. Yes. What else? So, a gray matter is also presented by nuclei. Uh, they are not nuclei, um, like, yes, nuclei. And they are known as basal ganglia or basal nuclei. So, ganglia is certainly wrong name for that. These are basal nuclei. And they are four. Uh, there is caudate nucleus, uh, lentiform nucleus, claustro, and inside the, cor uh, inside the temporal lobe there is amygdaloid body or amygdaloid complex. Amygdaloid complex. So here we can see, this is like a superior aspect, yes, we are uh, like looking upward, yes? So here we can see, this is caudate nucleus, here I, as Talamos I told you, this is lentiform nucleus, then laterally like very small plate of claustro, and amygdaloid body we cannot see here. If we look at this preparation, this is uh, a frontal section, yes? And here we can see, this is salamus. Salamus, we are not interested. Well, caudate nucleus, this one caudate nucleus. This is lentiform nucleus, here we can see very clearly, very good preparation, lentiform nucleus. And laterally, there is very small plate, yes, of claustrum. So what is the function? These are nuclei which start uh, this extra regulate uh, functioning of extrapyramidal system. Lentiform nucleus consists of two parts. There is medial part is named globus pallidus, pale globe, yes, and lateral part is named putamen, eggshell if to translate it from Latin. So they together with caudate nucleus, they form stria pallida system. So this caudate nucleus together with putamen forms corpus striatum, and this pale globe, uh, globus pallidus, uh, pallidus. Uh, globus pallidus, why is it named pale globe? Because it's lighter in color. It is a uh, comparatively more Asian structure. It contains less neuron bodies, and it uh, has activatory effect like, onto any movement. Uh, this caudate nucleus and putamen, they have inhibitory effect. So together they regulate muscle tone, extrapyramidal system. So, function of claustrum is still unknown, yes, and the amygdaloid body that is located here inside the temporal lobe, it is responsible for our emotional behavior, for fear and aggression. Amygdaloid complex, it is a group of nuclei that is located inside the temporal lobe. So, it was gray matter. White matter is presented by three types of fibers. Uh, association fibers, commissural fibers, and projectional fibers. So, first group is association fibers. Uh, it, uh, these are fibers which connect cortex within one hemisphere. So, these fibers do not leave hemisphere. They can connect edges in gyri, and they are short association fibers than OU fibers. They can connect different lobes, then they are long association fibers. So, examples of long association fibers, here we cannot see it because everything is covered by cortex. Just, uh, I can tell you where it approximately passes. So, there is superior longitudinal fasciculus that connects cortex or frontal lobe with occipital lobe. There is inferior longitudinal fasciculus that connects temporal lobe with frontal lobe. 
as it is, and the need for circulus that connects uh, parietal lobe from uncus it goes to the temporal lobe here. Inferior lobe, yes, there is cingulum also, cingulum, that goes from frontal lobe to the parietal lobe. So these are long association fibers. Commissural fibers is the second type of fibers. These are fibers which connect two hemispheres with each other. The largest structure that is formed by commissural fibers, this is corpus callosum. Corpus callosum. There are the others, such as anterior commissure, yes, posterior commissure, but posterior commissure, it is a part of midbrain, not cerebral hemispheres. Habenular commissure, and this posterior commissure doesn't connect with each other two hemispheres. It connects with each other two halves of the midbrain, yes? Habenular commissure, two halves of diencephalon. So about corpus callosum, yes, fornix also. Fornix is presented by both projectional and commissural fibers. Yes, here we can see it, for example. Here we can see also this is fornix, yes. So about corpus callosum, uh, we should say that uh, it has four parts. Anterior part is rostrum, then this curve is named genu or knee, then trunk or body, and then splenium. Uh, fibers uh, which pass through corpus callosum, uh, they, after that, laterally when they move, they radiate and they form radiation of corpus callosum, radiatio corporis callosi. Fibers which connect with each other cortex of frontal lobes of two hemispheres, they form here forceps minor or frontal forceps or anterior forceps. Uh, fibers which connect with each other uh, cortex of occipital lobes, they form here forceps major or posterior or occipital forceps. Okay, so about fornix. The fornix, it is a structure, belongs to renencephalon or olfactory brain. So it is like, uh, it is formed by olfactory fibers and it starts from um, crus, yes, crus or fornix. It starts at the region of perihippocampal gyrus, moves upward, continues to the body of fornix, body we also can see here, and then it ends with collets. Which, which part of fornix forms anterior wall of uh, third ventricle? It's not written like that part. It's no, written it's like really... only the fornix and the corpus callosum. No, no. I think cruise of or colons. I don't exactly Maybe remember. the cruise? You will find it. Okay. So here. Yes. I Yes. Okay. So this is uh, this is fornix. It starts from mammillary bodies here, mm -hmm. as the region of parahippocampal gyrus, and moves upward and to the crus. Yes, crus, I think, or colus. You will check. And ends uh, here in the anterior commissure, at the level, uh, the region of anterior commissure of the cerebral hemispheres. And projectional fibers. Projectional fibers. These are those fibers which connect with each other. Um, upper and lower parts of CNS. And uh, this structure that is formed by projectional fibers is known as internal capsule, capsula interna. Here we can see it. This is, here we also can see it. This is capsula interna. This, here we also can see it. This is capsula interna. So this internal capsule uh, is formed by white matter and it has two limbs. You see, it's like V shaped, yes, has two limbs, anterior limb, anterior limb, that is bounded medially by caudate nucleus and laterally by lentiform nucleus, posterior limb, that is bounded medially by thalamus, laterally by lentiform nucleus again, so this is thalamus, and here there is lentiform nucleus, posterior limb, between anterior and posterior limbs of internal capsule, there is genu or knee, uh, the genu or knee of internal capsule. Of internal capsule or corpus callosum? Internal capsule. But you are saying the corpus, corpus callosum cal also has genu, but this okay. is different things. So through each of these parts, anterior limb, posterior limb, uh, conducting tracts pass. Through anterior limb, uh, fibers which start from frontal lobe. Frontophalamic tract, frontopontine tract, uh, what, uh, frontorubral tract passes. Then through the knee of internal capsule, corticonuclear tract pass. And through posterior limb, it is corticospinal tract. Then occipital temporoparietopontine tract, salamocortical, auditory, and optic tract. And then all of them, they move upward and downward. Anyway, they radiate above the internal capsule, yes? And they form corona radiata, radiate crown. And then they distribute to corresponding 
regions of cortex where they are going. Ma'am, coronal radiator present in the thalamus region? No. No. Ah, no, above the thalamus, yes. Okay, above the thalamus. When which the internal thalamus. capsule, when it goes upward, passes the thalamus, above the thalamus, this coronal radiator is formed. And they are connected to the cerebral cortex area? Yes. Okay. Okay. Ah, what I forgot to tell you is that here, between lentiform nucleus and claustrum, there is external capsule, capsule externa, it's also white matter. Between claustrum and cortex of insula, there is <coughs> extreme capsule, capsula extrema. These are also fibers of association, association fibers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Caudate nucleus, this basal nucleus, is named caudate. Coda means tail, because here we actually can see only uh, head of caudate nucleus. It has also what? Head of caudate nucleus, like below uh, section passes, yes? After that, a body and tail. And tail. So cavity of cerebral hemispheres, they are two. Uh, they are lateral ventricles. Uh, I don't know why, but left ventricle is the first ventricle and right ventricle is the second. I don't know why it is considered like that. So it has, each lateral ventricle has four parts. There is central part that is inside the parietal lobe, the synatomic position. There is anterior horn inside the frontal lobe, inferior horn in the temporal lobe, posterior horn in the occipital lobe. Yes. You have to know how each of these parts is formed, by which structure. So central part, it has like it looks like a fissure, and it has uh, inferior wall and superior wall. Inferior wall is formed by dorsal surface of salamus. This is dorsal surface. This is dorsal surface of salamus also. Like this is we are looking superior aspect. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, it's like that must be together. Yes. So this is salamus, and laterally from salamus there are stria terminalis, and a stria terminalis uh, separate. Uh, salamus from body of caudate nucleus. So this is floor. Roof is formed by fibers of corpus callosum here. Then anterior horn is formed laterally by head of caudate nucleus, medially by septum pellucidum. This is between body of fornix and corpus callosum, anterior part. Septum pellucidum is stretched, yes? So this is medial wall of anterior horn of corpus callosum. And laterally, or uh, superlaterally, uh, there are again fibers of corpus callosum and also minor forceps. Then, here in the inferior horn, we see one structure that is named Fimbria hippocampi. So, this structure is, uh, resembles a seahorse. Yes, seahorse. Seahorse, does anybody understand what is this? Yes, this yes, animal, yes. So it looks Maybe like seahorse. And this, these are like fimbria, and then it continues upward. So this hippocamp, hippocampus, this structure, is formed by like impression that is formed by hippocampal sulcus. If you said here there is what? Ah, yes, now I got it. Now I got it. What? What? The perihippocampal gyrus continues to uncus, yes? Mm -hmm. And here there is, this is hippocampal sulcus. This is collateral sulcus. So this hippocampal sulcus, here it is like impression, and here from side of lateral it is elevation. That's how it is formed. Laterally from this hippo, fimbria hippocampi, there is collateral eminence. Collateral eminence that is formed by collateral sulcus. So this is collateral sulcus. And uh, what? Uh, superlateral wall of the um, inferior horn of lateral ventricle is formed by white matter of temporal lobe. And here, yes, inferiorly there is fimbria hippocampi and uh, collateral eminence. Okay. And posterior horn. On the lateral wall of posterior horn, there are two, also medial wall of posterior horn, there are two elevations. Superior one is known as calcar avis. Calcar avis. It is formed by impression of calcarine sulcus. Calcarine sulcus here. And inferior one is known collateral trigon. By collateral sulcus it is formed here. And also superlaterally, this is white matter. Um, of occipital lobe. lobe. Yes, of occipital lobe. Uh, you have to know the structure of each of parts of lateral ventricles. Uh, choroid plexus is also present here in lateral ventricles. So it enters through interventricular foramen. Uh, or foramen, it enters central part 
and then it goes to the inferior horn also. Somewhere it's also written that it goes to posterior horn, I think. <coughs> so this you have to read. Because in different books, different information is given. But except anterior horn. Anterior horn does not contain uh, choroid plexus. So choroid plexus serves for uh, production of cerebrospinal fluid. You also have to study limbic system and olfactory brain. Yes, or rhinencephalon. No, actually, these are nearly the same structures because olfactory analyzer is the most ancient analyzer during evolution at the period the first. So it includes the following structures. First, olfactory bulb. This is peripheral nervous system. Yes. Then olfactory tract, olfactory trigon, and then this olfactory trigon. Uh, fibers from olfactory trigon, they enter the brain through anterior perforated substance and then cingulate, and then they move along cingulate gyrus, parahippocampal gyrus, and uncus. Mammillary bodies also belong to rhinencephalon. So all fornix, fornix, all the um, structures which contain fibers or centers for infection, they belong to rhinencephalon. Limbic system includes nearly the same structures also, uh, in addition, it also contains uh, this amygdaloid body or amygdaloid complex because it also reflects our emotions, it affects our emotions. So, um, yes, limbic system is responsible for our mood also. Yes, so that's why smelling, olfaction, and mood, they are uh, associated with each other. So that's what you have to study for the next lesson. Any questions? Well, yeah. but I study somewhere that hippocampus and amygdala are same. No, they are just close, not the same. So what is the basic difference between the function difference, functional difference between them? No, they both belong to limbic system. Yes, this hippocampus and amygdaloid body. But amygdaloid body, this is this group of nuclei, and hippocampus it is just a structure uh, that is formed like it contains white matter. White matter. Yes. There are tracks along the, this uh, white matter pass, tracks pass.